hear about real ghost stories. But they're not what people think they are. They are usually small and, and gentle, gentle and have to do with love. The love of family. The love of place and the love of a state now called Mississippi. We have gathered together this evening to hear the stories that have come from all over the state. Stories of the souls that have stayed beyond their years. Who continue to love. The unfinished mansion in Natchez, where Dr. Holler Nutt still putters around in his garden, and his wife Julia can be seen on the staircase of the home they longed to finish, Longwood. The Lady of Annandale at the Church of the Cross in Madison, who continually visits the grave of her fiancé, who was killed on their wedding day. Dunlap on the Natchez, where the lady of the house can still be heard practicing her heart. Mackey's Creek on the Natchez Trace, also known as Lover's Leap, where two star-crossed Indian lovers leapt to their deaths when they could not be together, and still their weeping can be heard. Oak Hall in Vicksburg, where the ghost of Fanny Vic Willis has been felt to give visitors a kind of hug, the feeling of both grief and relief simultaneously. The old Capitol building in Jackson, where a man died at his desk, still returns to work to do his job. The Under the Hill Saloon in Natchez, where a man dressed in uniform possibly an American spy, is being followed by Spanish soldiers. Cedar Grove, near Vicksburg, where the ten children of the Pine family can still be heard rumbling in the upstairs hallway. Lake Mott out in Vicksburg, home to Mrs. Lake, or the perfume lady, whose strong scent can be smelled on afternoons in the yard where she used to take walks every day during life as she waited for the return of her husband. The Haunted Theaters of Mississippi, the Princess Theater, the Lyric Theater, the Grand Opera House, the Princess Theater in Columbus, where the original owner can still be found standing in the back of the balcony during films. The Lyric Theater of Tupelo, where the mischievous Antoine takes keys, opens doors, and wanders the halls at night. The Grand Opera House of Meridian, home to the lady, a grand dame singer who loves the whole concert when she thinks no one is in the building. Burnt Bridge in Hattiesburg, where a girl took in the Carson on a prom night still runs the bridge and her prom dress. Cy Connor, who took revenge on his wife and her lover, was executed at the Noxaby County Jail, now library in Macon, still roams the halls as if in chains to where his cell used to be. These are but some of the souls whose love for Mississippi have kept them here. Some of the stories you hear tonight are hard to believe. Some all too easy. And while there may be many who do not believe in hauntings or even in life hereafter, the stories you will hear this evening are all actual stories. True stories. The ghost stories of Mississippi. In Lauderdale County, there is a bridge, ancient and worn, built in the 1850s. One of the few bridges spanning the width of the Chunky River. An innkeeper by the name of Stuckey established his inn at the foot of the bridge, providing a place of rest for travelers crossing the bridge or coming up the river. But Stuckey was, unbeknownst to these travelers, a member of the infamous Dalton Gang, those notorious bank robbers who met their end in a shootout in Kansas. 
Stucky had found a method to continue his murderous ways by preying on the people staying at his inn. He would kill them, steal their money, and bury their bodies down by the river. Eventually, these practices caught up with Stucky, and he was hung from the middle of the bridge and left there for several days. When they finally cut his body down, they simply dropped it into the river below. Today, it is said that Stucky's spirit still haunts his bridge. People have often claimed to see a body hanging from the center of the bridge, and some even say that they can hear the sound of the splash as the body drops into the water below. Local teens have often claimed to have been chased off of the bridge by a spectral figure, and say that sometimes they can even see Stucky with his lantern, walking down by the river's edge, perhaps still in the act of burying his victims. Welcome to Mary Hope. Mary Hope, a stately home in the city of Meridian, was one of the six buildings to survive the 1864 assault by General William Tecumseh Sherman, whose Valentine's Day scorched earth massacre devastated much of the area. The name Mary Hope signifies three things. Mayor for the city of Meridian, Re for restoration, and Hope for hopes and dreams fulfilled. The home itself was a dream fulfilled for Jariah Jackson, daughter of Meridian's earliest settler, a Mr. Richard McLemore, who had the home constructed as a wedding present. The small cabin was then expanded after being purchased by the John Gary family, who moved from Alabama following the loss of their teenage daughters, Eugenia and Christina, to consumption at the end of the Civil War. The Garys lived in the home for a number of years before moving down to the coast, but after Hurricane Camille, the Garys' home on the coast was destroyed, and several remaining artifacts were brought back to their old home, now restored. They say that the weather-worn portraits of the Gary girls, who never actually lived at Mary Hope, have brought with them a spirit, that of Eugenia Gary. Her figure, dressed in a full hoop skirt from the 1870s, has been seen numerous times throughout the house, most often in the room where her portrait hangs. It is said that she can be heard singing in the bridal suite of the house and even appears outside the window during party events. And sometimes she plays the piano. People that have encountered her spirit describe her not as being spectral white, but instead she has lovely turquoise eyes and wears a rich green plaid dress. They say that Eugenia is a comforting spirit, at times playful, following you around the house, blowing on the back of your neck, and even sometimes only appearing to one person out of a group visiting the house. Perhaps a more mischievous spirit is said to inhabit the periwinkle room. In the early 1900s, the home was, for a time, divided into apartments. And in what was once the periwinkle room lived a disgruntled former teacher, a man haunted by the twin demons of drinking and gambling. One night, after having finished several bottles of whiskey, he lined them up on the wood mantel shot each of the bottles, then shot himself. It is said that his spirit stays in the room, often leaving the impression of a body laying on the bed in the morning, perhaps having a mid-morning nap. At other times of the day, the smell of cigars and cold spots can be sensed around the room. It is said that even though he may move furniture or stomp across the floor, that he will not leave the room. However, displeased he may be at the presence of visitors to the house. Visitors like the unwelcome Union soldier seen frantically rushing to the front door sometimes at night. The bell will ring. When the door is opened, no one is there. This way. Come on. 
Along this trail, you can find a graveyard. Thirteen small stones mark the graves of a group of unknown Confederate soldiers. Their headstones facing away from the trail. Keep moving. To Waverly. The very trees mourn for her. Their leaves drooped around her without a gust of wind. And indeed, she looks like one that would never see them green again. That line from an 18th century novel written by Sir Walter Scott could very easily describe the plantation for which the story was written, Waverly. Waverly was built in 1840 for Colonel George Hampton Young, a marvel in its day, completely self-sustaining as well as a destination for many in the area to see Young's many innovations in the home. But for a 50-year period, the house sat abandoned and fell into disrepair. The current owners of the home believe that she has guardian angels who protected her during her five decades of abandonment. The spirit of a young girl, a child, believed to be two-year-old Cynthia Hampton, who reportedly caught her head in the railing of the staircase and snapped her neck. The spirit is said to take afternoon naps at the bedroom at the top of the stairs, leaving a child-sized indentation and the sheets needing to be remade as if someone has laid in them. You can still hear Cynthia softly calling across the grounds. She is believed to be the primary guardian of the house. She wears a high necked nightgown has long, dark blonde hair, and once she is seen, disappears into a pale white mist. A story goes that during a major ball taking place at the mansion, a lantern was placed too close to a leaded mirror, heating it up, and snapped it with a loud clang. They say if you look deep into the mirror, you can still see the faces of the people at the ball that night. Figures dancing around the room, young girls in their finest, men standing around the edge of the room, and in one corner, a Confederate soldier seated, only one leg showing, possibly injured in battle. At night, the spectral figure of a rider on a horse can be seen and heard galloping across the ground. The ghost is believed to be Major Jack Fletchland an English soldier who interpreted for the Mississippi Choctaw during the Revolutionary War. His wife, also a Choctaw, conducted Flitchland's funeral in traditional warrior fashion, burying his rifle boots and saddle in his coffin and his horse killed and buried nearby. At night, you can still hear the distant sound of pounding hoofs as they grow nearer and nearer until the whoosh of the passing phantom rider thunders to the plantation known as Waverly. Now, wasn't that just sad? Follow me, let's go down to the wine cellar and have some drinks. Thank you. Come on in. Scoot on over. Come on. Near Pinckneyville, Mississippi, there is a plantation by the name of Cold Springs. An oddly constructed house built in the 1790s for a Dr. John Carmichael. His career was medicine, but his passion was wine. Below the boards of Cold Springs, Dr. Carmichael installed an extensive wine cellar, stocking it with bottles from far and wide, and often restocking it to supply his appetite for sampling the collection. Dr. Carmichael spent a great deal of time down in the cellar, even to the extent of moving his favorite rocking chair down there so that he could sip and rock and sip and rock. It was his greatest peace in life 
his pride and his joy. Well, after many years, Dr. Carmichael passed from this earth and arrangements were being made for his funeral. It was discovered that in his will, Dr. Carmichael had an unusual request for his chosen pallbearers. They were to take his body down into the cellar and finish every last drop of his precious wine collection alongside his dead body. It took the men two days to empty the cellar and another day to recover. On that third day, they discovered that they had buried the body, but they could not remember where. Once they finally came to their senses, they exhumed the coffin and loaded it onto the wagon to take to the cemetery. But even this process took some time as they continuously found that as they rode away from Cold Springs with its wine cellar below, that the coffin would no longer be on the wagon, but it would be a few dozen yards behind. So they would have to backtrack, reload the wagon, and begin again, only to find that the coffin had dropped a short while later. Today, Dr. Carmichael is properly buried in the Pinckneyville Cemetery, but on cold, dark nights, it is said that you can still hear his favorite rocking chair creaking in the cellar of the Cold Springs Plantation. as to why it will not grow, but they said that the spirits return every full moon to dance the witch's dance again. Another witch story. You come this way. To hear the tale of the Yazoo witch, an old woman who lived outside Yazoo City in the 1880s. Her house on the banks of Yazoo were said to be surrounded by starving cats and that she kept skeletons in the rafters. She's described as being half ghost, half scarecrow, but all witch. She would lure fishermen up the river, poison them with arsenic, and then bury them in the woods nearby. The people of Yazoo gathered a posse to investigate the missing person and went out to her cabin, where they said they found her standing over the bodies of two men on her floor, dancing an incantation over them. She fled to the woods with the posse behind her. The woods near Yazoo are swampy, filled with patches of quicksand, which fell into a patch of quicksand and slowly drowned. As she sank, she cried out, loud enough for the people to hear, a curse on the city of Yazoo. Now she returned in 20 years and burned the city to the ground. Her body was retrieved and placed as a landmark for all to see. Her grave surrounded by a ring of chains. 
in 1904, exactly 20 years later. A young Miss Wise, in preparing for her wedding day, knocked over a lantern and started a fire. Reports say that an unusual wind settled in over Yazoo City that day, out of any natural weather pattern for that time of year. The wind blew violently across the city, and over 300 buildings were destroyed that day. Visitors to the cemetery soon after noticed that the chains surrounding the witch's grave had all been broken. The witch's curse had come to pass. Come, come now and hear the stories of McRaven. Gather round. Yes, come closer, please. Come closer. Listen. There are many houses in Vicksburg that have stories attached to them. Strange noises, moving objects, footsteps, and occasionally apparitions. But there is one house known to be the single most haunted house in all of Mississippi. And it is the house known as McRaven. McRaven is a home built piece by piece by each succeeding generation adding to the previous part, from the small cabin to the mansion that it is today. Its first inhabitant was a man named Andrew Glass, who, along with his wife, led a gang of robbers along the Natchez Trace. The back room at the time was only accessible by a rope ladder, which they would pull up to avoid being, avoid being ambushed. During one of their thefts, Glass was injured and fearful that the gang would be captured and possibly tortured, his wife took him to the back room and slit his throat. Glass's ghost may believe that he is not able to leave the room, for he stays only in that room, and his footsteps are heard walking about the room at night. One of McRaven's most playful ghosts is that of Mary Elizabeth Howard. A child bride at 12, she died during childbirth at 15. And soon after, her husband took their child and moved away. It is said she searches through the house looking for her baby. Mary Elizabeth appears to visitors on the staircase and sometimes in the dining room. A woman with long brown hair wearing a plain dress from the period. She is reported to divert people, attempting to tour the house, often leading them back to her own bedroom, where some of her artifacts, such as her wedding shawl and her bedspread, are said to emit a noticeable heat. Her shawl is said to even spontaneously leap out of her outstretched hands. She likes to show up in visitors' photographs, often posing to the side of group photos. For many years, the owners of the house, who live elsewhere in Vicksburg, are called up late at night by neighbors telling them the light in the middle bedroom has been left on again. You want to make ravens more mischievous families is that of the Murrays. One time, a young visitor told his mother that he wanted to go play with that little red boy. There is no way that the child could have known that the Murrays had a redheaded son who died at the age of four. McRaven served as a union headquarters during the siege of Vicksburg. There are 28 grave sites on the property where now a headstone sits. Known but to God, unknown dead, 1863 lest we forget. It was during this time that one Captain McPherson went missing. His commanding officer, Colonel Wilson, was about to send out a search party when a figure, bloodied and wet, appeared to him. It was McPherson's ghost. Returned to tell Wilson that he, he had been attacked, murdered, and thrown into the river. 
which was the same place where the search party had found his body. It is said that McPherson returns to tell his story to every new owner of the house. In 1926, a conductor for the Illinois Central Railroad was going through the town of Beauregard on their way to Brookhaven. While the train was picking up speed, the conductor saw a light, perhaps from a small lantern, swinging violently up ahead. He pulled the brakes and as the train ground its way to a halt, he wondered what kind of emergency had caused someone to stop the train. He stepped down to investigate, but he could see no one. All he could see was an abandoned house in the distance that clearly had no one living in it. He boarded the train once more and made his way to Brookhaven, where he told the people there of the mysterious person flagging down the train. It was a story that they had heard many times before. The cyclone of 1883 had wiped out most of what had been the town of Beauregard. One of the few remaining buildings included the large home of one Dr. Elias Ford Rowan, who had built the three-story, 24-room home that one day it may serve as a hospital facility. And here he had his chance. Rowan was well respected in the town for his service that day and for his considerable church work. He was hardly a man anyone expected would become the suspect in a haunting. But by the middle of the 1910s, the old house was found abandoned. All of the good doctor's furniture still there, collecting dust and the house rotting away. It seems that around 1912, the doctor, who by this time was quite elderly, had come down to the train tracks from Jackson to collect a patient who was to stay with him. It was supposed the old man, hard of hearing, had been walking the rails with his back to the oncoming train, only to turn at the last moment and desperately wave his lantern to stop the train. Too late. Dr. Bowman now haunts that spot where he had done and planned to do so much good, waving his lantern to collect the patient. He is now the lantern man at the Illinois Central Spook Light. Here come this way. Terry, Mississippi, 1901 when my brothers and I were young whippersnappers and my dear old Gran would come down to the bedroom late at night and warn us, if you do not go to sleep, the sack man will get you. He were an old man with a switchblade and a thick fatherly beard and a tattered old brown knapsack slung over his shoulder and he would walk down Moncure Marble Road roaming and moaning and searching for sleepless children. And when he found them, he would slice them and dice them and throw them in the sack and put it over his back and take them away. If you do not go to sleep, the sack man will get you. William Faulkner was fond of telling the story of Judith Shegog, whose ghost, he said, haunted his home, Rowan Oak. The story goes that two soldiers fought for the young woman's affections, and either they killed each other in the duel, and she jumped off of the balcony in grief, or their duel caused an errant shot that killed the young woman, or while trying to run away with one of the soldiers, she fell from the balcony to her death. Her ghost still roams the garden path of the home to this day. Let's go this way to King's Tavern now.
In 1789, a man named Prosper King purchased land in what is now Natchez, Mississippi. There, he built an inn and tavern. The place also served as where the mail would be delivered. King called the place Post House, but it was later renamed after its first owner as King's Tavern. Hello, hello, hello! <laughs> ah. King's Tavern! Gather round. <laughs> King's Tavern is home to a number of different spirits. Some say that the king, he still walks the grounds. Hey, a surly figure who sometimes shoves guests he does not like. But being in a frontier town at the time, a king was not fond of Native Americans and would never allow them into his tavern. But it is said that a dark figure of a man wearing a Native American headdress, he stands on the front porch of the king's living quarter, either unwilling or just unable to go on the inside. But a Native American touring the king's living quarters, he, he was just headed back downstairs where he felt a forceful hand painting him to the railing. See, at first he didn't know what was going on, but when he made it back outside, he noticed four red welts where his arm had been pinned. King would have not been happy to have him in the living quarters. And that's for a fact. The large figure of a man in the top hat also appears in King's Tavern in the main room near a large mirror. He appears as a shadow in the mirror and can be seen in pictures taken there as well. Turn this way. The cries of a baby can also be heard. A baby reportedly killed by the bandit Big Park because its cries were disturbing to drinking. But by far, the most well-known spirit at King's Tavern is that of the young barmaid Madeline. Madeline was a sassy young lady, full of energy and mischief. It did not take long for the lovely young woman to catch the eye of the much older and already married Prosper King. Madeline became King's mistress for a time, but Mrs. King was on to them. So the story goes, the jealous Mrs. King hired two rough men, the kind that often passed through the Natchez, to murder Madeline. Once Madeline was dispatched, somehow Mrs. King was also able to kill the two men she had hired to get rid of Madeline. It was many years later that three bodies, one young woman and two men, were found walled up into the downstairs fireplace. In the young woman's chest was a jeweled dagger. This was believed to be Madeline and her attackers. Now, Madeline continues to haunt King's Tavern to this day. A mischievous sprite, she loves to turn on faucets off and on, as well as lights. And one hanging chain in the kitchen area, she likes to make swing back and forth. In one of the rooms upstairs where she loves to nap, she likes to nap. The warmth of body heat can be felt above the mattress. And sometimes the fireplace where the bodies were found, a fireplace which has not housed a fire in more than a hundred years, can be felt to be producing heat. One of the doors upstairs, which has swelled over the years and cannot be moved without force, she likes to make swing open as people walk down the hall. But her favorite pastime is to follow people up the stairs, tugging the ponytails of women and tapping the shoulders of men. A portrait, a European painting coincidentally called Alluring Madeline, now hangs over the fireplace at King's Tavern. Upon looking into the eyes of the barmaid in the painting, poet B. Sillery described her this way. Madeline, alluring Madeline, sweet sixteen with a dimple in her chin, love for the tavern keeper sealed her fate. 
when the coy barmaid chose the wrong mate. For the tavern keeper had a wife who knew too well how to wield a knife. Now alluring Madeline, a pretty little ghost is she, haunting King's Tavern for all eternity. <laughs> this way? Now! <laughs> uh, uh, Wally and my Kaija Hot. They are known as Hot Brothers. They were born in North Carolina. Um, to Scottish family, I see. Very loyal to the British Revolution. Growing up, they spent a great deal of time fighting colonists. They were plunder and pillage colonial settlements. And on several occasions, joining factions of Creek and Cherokee. And on other occasions, joining what were called rape gangs. Now, after America won this independence, the pair they fell in with a band of pirates along the Mississippi River. At one point, Killing their leader! <laughs> and trying to collect a reward for him also. Now, the river eventually, this way, this way, this way, the river eventually brought them down to Natchez. At the foot of the trace, where they begin their reign of terror, back from the north of New Orleans, from the primary passage. <laughs> now, this is more interesting. The Hot Brothers, they were regularly bother travelers by just stopping them and torturing them and robbing them and killing them. They are known as America's first serial killers because their acts has been motivated by bloodlust, then financial gain. Little Hot, he was hung as a pirate along with some of his cohorts. And after a prolonged search for Big Harp, guess what? He was taken down by a posse where he was, where he was shot! Ah! Stabbed! And beheaded! His head being displayed on the trace as a warning for would-be marauders. Now it is said that Big Harp he still haunts this race till this day. <laughs> Looking for more victims. Another bandit of the trace is Joseph Thompson Hare, a Pennsylvania boy, a notorious clothes horse, whose first career was as a tailor's apprentice. His love of costume and fabrics stuck with him his whole life. When robbing the farmers and peddlers of the trace, he and his gang would cover their faces in berry juice to make themselves appear even more frightening. After they'd robbed enough money, they headed south to New Orleans to spend their stolen stash. They got into a number of bloody fights, and Hare even once hosted a cotillion. Caught by the Spanish on their way out of town, they would have been executed had it not been for some of their grateful cotillion guests who vouched for their character and honesty. After they were released, they returned to their previous ways and Hare headed back to Natchez, where he gave a great deal of expensive jewelry to his girlfriend, later to find out she had been unfaithful. He buried her alive with the jewels still on. Hiding out in a cave outside of Vicksburg, Hare wrote in his diary, Let not anyone be induced to turn highwaymen by reading of the great sums of money I have robbed, for it is a desperate life, full of danger, and sooner or later ends in the gallows. Hare was right. He was caught by a posse on his way out of town, and while trying to outrun the posse, he claimed he saw a magnificent rider on a white horse and became so frightened he could no longer run. He spent the night in a nearby cabin, but the next morning he was caught by the posse and spent the next five years in jail, where he spent all of his time reading the Bible because he believed that the rider on the white horse had been a messenger from heaven to get him to turn from his wicked ways. Of course, 
after being released, it did not take him long to return back to his previous ways, and he was caught robbing a night mail coach outside of Baltimore. Hare was hanged in front of a crowd of 1,500. They say you can still hear his boisterous laugh in the Under the Hill Saloon by the river in Natchez, and that his ghost carries the jewels he'd given his girlfriend. <laughs> I guess you caught that one coming, huh? <laughs> All right, um, one more story. And the Gulf is a small ship of land. It's, it's known as Deer Island. But many years before that, it housed a small amusement park. Um, but many years later, it was a landing place for marauding men looking for a safe place. Come this way. A safe place to guard their treasure and just to hide out, I guess. But pirates, they range from far and wide across the rich and welcoming waters of the Gulf of Mexico. But one of these pirates, in particular, known as Captain Tibbler, he made his way, this way, this way, this way, he made his way amongst the waters and came across the waters of Biloxi and came ashore what is known as Deer Island. Now, he did this so he could protect his hall. But before heading back, he decided to leave a single sentry, which is a crew member, just to guard his ranch and to protect it from any scallywag wanting to raid it. But before heading back, Captain Tibler, he had a different plan on his hand. So he took the lonely crew member and ran him through, ah, 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 telling him instantly, the vicious pirate he beheaded the crew, leaving his body perched on the site, arranged with a set of palmetto branches. He did this so he could scare off any treasure raiders from raiding his treasure. Now, the sentry has did his job and has continued to do so. But, look, a century later, a pair of fishermen taking refuge on the island, I said they went on an island, no more than a few minutes, when they heard the rustling sound of palmetto branches. When there was no wind. See, at first, they thought it was like a wild hog or some animal, but it was no more than a few moments later when that, that headless pirate skeleton sentry chased those men off Deer Island, keeping any treasure buried there safe. Now, the sentry has continued to keep safe watch over the waters of Deer Island as the fire water goes has been seen hovering between the waters of Biloxi and Ocean Springs. He had a, he had a, a blue faded light as a lantern in his outstretched arms. Keeping safe watch over the waters of the island. Tonight, we have gathered here and heard the stories that have come from all over the state of Mississippi. People stories. won't take care. Go ahead, my sister. Stories of the souls that have way overstayed their years. Now, people want to hear about real those stories. But they're not exactly what we think they are. They're usually small and gentle and have to do with the love. The love of family. <coughs> the love of people and the, the love of the state, state called, called Mississippi. Mississippi. The souls we have heard of this evening, their love has kept them here beyond their years. Beyond these, their time. And these are the, the ghost, ghost stories of, of Mississippi. Mississippi.